we are live. So I'm so excited today because today we are talking about going virtual, how to capture capital in connections despite COVID. And um, I'm an executive advisor and diversity strategist at Rework Work. I'm Stacey Gordon, and I and my team coach and counsel executive leaders on DEI strategies for the business while offering a no-nonsense approach to unconscious bias education for the broader employee population. We have had the privilege of working around the globe with Fortune 100 companies and with CEOs and their executive teams, and that's part of the reason that my unconscious bias course is number one on the LinkedIn learning platform. And we're celebrating that today. In fact, we're celebrating that for the next few weeks since LinkedIn learning has made the course free for everyone to enjoy. What isn't free is my book, Unbiased, Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work, but it's a nominal cost and is available worldwide. So what I wanna do is I do want to introduce our fabulous, fabulous guest. There's a link for my book. And I think it is, um, I'm so excited to talk to Dr. Novellis. I you just don't know. Um, because we started talking and you can see we're dressed alike today. I forgot to ask you when your birthday is, like maybe we're twins, I don't know. <laughs> July 7th. <laughs> Wait, July 7th? Yeah. I'm um, July 15th, stop oh, it. No. <laughs> yes. That's our brother's birthday. Yes, we're a week apart. Okay, that makes sense. That is so funny. Oh my goodness. All right. So this is why I love doing these lives because we just get to chat and talk and, um, but I will not ramble. I will try my best not to ramble. So I do want to go ahead and uh, tell you about Dr. Roshana Novellis, who is the founder and CEO of Enricher, which is a financial technology platform that matches revenue generating companies led by women and founders of color to individual and institutional sources of funding. Since 2017, Enricher has deployed upwards of $4 million through its platform and matched business owners to 13 million in working capital through its accelerator. By providing capital, coaching and connections, we are fueling the fastest growing demographic of business owners. So their network has engaged with over 23,000 advocates through its digital community and in-person activations. And you're gonna explain that to us. But I got one more thing for us before we dive all the way in. And that's some stats because I know that Dr. Novellis knows this already, but many of our viewers today might not. So the United States has 12.3 million women-owned businesses they generate $1.8 trillion a year, that's trillion. 40% of US businesses are women owned. 64% of new women owned businesses were started by women of color last year. Latina women owned businesses grew more than 87%. 62% of women entrepreneurs cite their business as their primary source of income. Private tech companies led by women achieve 35% higher return on investment. That's right, 35% higher return on investment if it's led by a woman. And we have seen that women founded companies outperform companies founded by men by 63%. Yet women receive just 7% of venture funds for their startups. So I would ask you why you started in Richard, but something tells me it has something to do with those statistics. Tell us. Yes. And Why did you get started? About black women, it would be less than 1% of all venture funds go to companies led by black women. But clearly I started in richer because there is a bias in the decision making uh, side of who gets money. And that's why we provide a working capital to companies led by women and people of color. There is a lack of inclusion, a, lot, a lack of trust in our abilities to succeed, even though, as you stated, um, pretty much if you invest in us over our counterparts, we're going to win. <laughs> All the stats show that we, like you said, we have a higher return on investment. We have more grit. Even if a woman um, takes out a loan and her business fails, she typically will still repay all of her debts because we are a better steward of capital than our male counterparts. So it's really a no brainer to build this platform. Furthermore, there is a lack of uh, diversity inclusion in the lending ma marketplace. There is a overabundance of bias in the financial landscape. You know, as recent as the 80s for the women, for a woman to get a loan, she needed to have a 
male co-signer. And I was already, I always remember the first woman who got an MBA, she had to get her 15 year old son to co-sign on her business loan to start her business. Teenage. Wow. Her, wow. her MBA from Harvard didn't matter. <laughs> and so a lot of these uh, financial ecosystem algorithms to judge women and people of color have not changed in all these years. So even if a woman has a higher personal credit score than her male counterpart, her business score is often lower automatically simply because of her gender. And so for all of these reasons, Enricher provides an inclusive ecosystem that's supportive. Not only do we provide this ecosystem, we also provide that capital. And then we also provide um, love for uh, these entrepreneurs who work around the clock and just want that part of their life to be fulfilled as well. Well, I'm excited to talk to you about that. We, we're going to get there. Um, I'm, I was like, in love, this sounds really interesting. Yes. Um, but uh, teaser, teaser, you want to definitely stay around to talk about this. Um, but you mentioned something that is, it just, as I sit here, I feel my blood pressure rising, <laughs> right? Because it's so frustrating. Um, and that is the, the FICO score, right? Your credit score. So not a lot of people realize that FICO scores were introduced in 1989. Like consider that 1990, right? Like not that long ago. And when they did it, it was done because they were trying to create a, um, an objective way to evaluate credit because people were getting denied credit because underwriters would just decide, you know, look at you and say, oh, you're a woman, you probably can't pay it. You're not giving you the money, right? Um, or you didn't have a male co-signer. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't getting the money anyway. <laughs> but understanding that FICO scores are this, this relatively new uh, introduction to the way that we are judged. And even though it was supposed to be objective, it is still being used in such a subjective way. Because some of the things, I mean, you were just telling me a story and you have to tell everybody about this story about your house. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm upset. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, I'll start with the first part and then talk about my house. But a lot of people don't realize when coming up with scores like the FICO score, there are things like what's your proximity to a liquor store? What's your proximity to a casino? What's your proximity to a lot of businesses that happen to have a higher frequency in communities where people of color and women live in? And so because you live in a proximity of a certain business, you automatically have a lower score, whether or not it has anything to do with you. And clearly that's not fair. So you'll have a higher interest rate if you live closer to certain types of businesses, right? So that's a way that there is bias uh, looped into the process. And that's one of the reason Enricher has alternative underwriting so that people um, that the people that we serve aren't charged with higher interest rates. And the story I was telling you earlier was that when I was buying my new house this year, the closing attorney, he was a white guy, was just shocked of that, the interest rate that I was being charged. And he said, you know, this is a pre predatory rate. You know that um, this is way too high. This is the highest rate I've seen. And I know you and the work that you do. I know you have perfect credit. So it makes really no sense that they're charging you this amount of money to buy your house. Um, and I said, yes, I know the whole system is rigged. It's biased. I understand that. You know, the moment they saw my license, I knew I was going to be charged a higher rate. And, and I know the underwriters did all they could do to prevent me from buying this house just in terms of the volume of, of diligence and activity that they had me um, provide them. And I even told them, you know, I know my rights. I know some of these things are illegal. And then they stopped. <laughs> um, but I went through the process because I really wanted to purchase this home. And these are the things that we have to consider when we are charged more interest than our counterparts. That means that more of our monthly income is allocated to our homes and which, which decreases the amount of generational wealth that we have. It decreases our ability to withstand changes in tax rates, to be able to withstand, you know, increased prices of the, the, the stores and other um, items in our communities and, and eventually could uh, lead to us leaving when we could totally afford to be there from the beginning. 
And right. So this is one of the reasons that Enricher has invested in unbiased practices when we do uh, our underwriting. The average business loan is 88 percent. And a lot of uh, uh, lending companies uh, kind of hide this. They say, oh, it's only eight to 10 percent per month. But eight to 10 percent per month times 12, you know, that's really high interest. And so one of the reasons I started this company is so that we can provide affordable capital so that these companies led by women, black founders, people of color can sustain and grow and they can have economic power. Right, right. And I, I think, you know, this is the interesting thing because <clears throat> we're talking about careers, connections, right, and related to capital. And when we think about COVID, right, all these C's, um, that some of that has been disrupted. But what is interesting is when you think that many individuals who have been displaced or furloughed or let go, right, during the, the pandemic, many times we talk about DEI and looking at equity in the workplace, a lot of times the people who are on the short end of that stick are people of color first, right? So they are the first to be fired and they're the last to be rehired. So that also impacts their ability to be able to pay for their housing or pay their bills, um, which then impacts their credit score. And this is how we get into this, this spiral, right? Um, and I think the other thing that you said about uh, lending, it, it's so true, even from, from a career standpoint, because it's one of the reasons that I got into working in, uh, in the DEI space was I was working as a recruiter and I, um, I always knew I had to work harder, right? To get women hired, to get people of color hired, but it really smacked me in the face <laughs> when I was working with this one particular um, gentleman uh, who, I had talked to the CEO who was ready to hire this man. And he was like, I'm sending you an offer letter for him. And I'm like, great, I'm about to get paid finally. This is great, I need my commission. And then like weeks go by and nothing. And I had to do all this extra work. I had to send him back in for another interview. I had to have him talk to board members and all of these different things because all of a sudden these additional people popped up and we're really looking at him and saying, hmm, does this black man really need the six figure job? Is he really deserving, right? And so here is somebody who is getting ready to you know, embark on taking a job that they were well qualified for and should have gotten a month earlier and almost didn't if it wasn't for the fact that I had to work harder and advocate for him and push to get him in the door when, you know, like these are the kinds of things if you, if you add those together, right? Somebody who doesn't get the job they're supposed to get and is now dealing with predatory lending. This is why you can't accumulate wealth in some of our lower socioeconomic uh, communities. This is why they, they re remain lower socioeconomic communities. Right. And none of us wants to go through life um, having to constantly prove ourselves every day. I know as a former engineer, uh, one of the reasons I left that world was people were like, do you know what you're doing? And I would always say, you know, I have a PhD in computer engineering. I clearly know more than someone who just graduated from undergrad. Like I've been doing this for, and I was so tired of having to justify my existence in those spaces. But sometimes that's all the power that these people have. So a lot of times when the financial ecosystem and like you said, um, with certain uh, corporations, they go in to hiring decisions, financing decisions, making the person feel like they need to defend themselves. And we haven't done anything wrong. We're more than qualified. We exceed all of the minimum requirements. And a lot of times we just don't feel like being bothered. So one of the reasons I said, hey, I need to start a tech platform was someone was like, oh, were you the victim of that? Did someone like you got you got so tired of having to justify yourself that you exited technology. And I was like, I didn't do that. And so a lot of us will exit the housing process. We'll say, forget it. I don't want to get a loan because we don't want to deal with the foolishness. Whereas that's another way just to have bias to prevent us from accessing the resources and the capital that we're entitled to. And again, this is why, you know, Enricher has a 100% diverse team and we have, you know, 100% of our people who help, you know, companies through the process are part of this community. So all of that is gone. You don't have to deal with any of this 
foolishness where you have to really uh, defend why you exist in this ecosystem. Right. Definitely. And I think that's one of the reasons that women owned businesses have skyrocketed uh, through the through COVID, through the pandemic. Right. Because we have to be able to uh, make money still. And in especially during uh, the pandemic, when we were still also the people who had the, um, were, I won't say bearing the brunt of, but the greatest responsibility for taking care of the children. How do you take care of children and try to work a job, right? So m many uh, women said, oh, screw it, I'm just gonna exit. I'm gonna make this easier on myself. It's also why right now we have this you know, great resignation um, and I can't stand that that phrase, um, I'm really calling it the great reevaluation because the re great resignation makes it seem as though, uh, you know, employees don't have the right to do what is best for them and quit a messed up job. It's like you cannot pay people poorly and treat people poorly and expect them to stay. That <laughs> you is, just can't do it. That is so true. And that's also like one of the benefits of COVID is that it gave a lot of people the reset or the push that they needed to reevaluate their lives. And many of them said, hey, I want to be in charge of my economic footprint. And um, it helped a lot of business owners, especially those who live in small towns, because previously, in order to participate in an event that was held for instance, here in Atlanta, New York, or LA, you had to travel. And as you mentioned before, a lot of times the women were the people who were in charge of all the children and their household. And it was a harder, um, it was harder for them to access these types of opportunities. But now, because a lot of them have decided, hey, I'm going to reevaluate, I'm going to leave this position where people treat me poorly, and I'm going to invest my time and energy into more of these virtual kind of offerings for my business or other types of things that will make me happy and, and enable me to be in charge of our my own you know footprint and how I want to show up in the world. Definitely. And I, we see that a lot right now. And so um, I think, you know, we think about what this looks like, um, you know, and I think the, the, the credit thing really just really got me. Um, and there's we talk about barriers, these barriers in the workplace um, and in the business. Right. It, there's just barriers in general. And why is that? Because as humans, we are inclined to create barriers. We are the type of people who, you know, you exit a burning building and then you want to turn around and like lock the doors, right? It's like, oh, I got out. But not only do you get out, but then you want to prevent others from, from reaching the same heights that you have as well. And I don't know what that is um, about our, our the, the way that we work as humans, but we really have to start getting over that, right? And so a lot of the work that we do in the DEI space is looking at how do we interrupt that bias? Because we can't stop it, right? We can't, our brains just automatically go to it. Um, and so part of it is just, I, I, would, I would love to say if there are underwriters <laughs> listening right now, please, for the love of God, take an unconscious bias course. Like, let me, let me put up the, the <laughs> link right here, right? Uh, because right now, LinkedIn, I think that's something that I'm really seeing is that for my course, the unconscious bias course to be the number one course, um, and for the others, it, you know, two and three for the longest have been um, on diversity, inclusion and belonging or on bias in the workplace. And so right now everyone is focusing on this. Um, but what we really have to start doing is it's one thing to focus and listen, but then we've got to start actually asking, how am I contributing to creating these barriers? So I would love people to take a look. Go to take a course, right? And ask themselves this question because I do think that there are so many individuals right now who don't realize that they are part of the problem. Right. And in the last year, a lot of corporations have been empowered to um, really look at their bias. And a lot of organizations even made pledges that, hey, on the diversity inclusion front, they're going to hire more diverse staff or on the entrepreneurship side that they pledge a certain amount of money to support um, Black founders, women founders, diverse founders. And honestly, a lot of the organizations have had a lot of difficulty 
um, abiding by their these pledges because deep down it was hard for them to really check their bias. And case in point, like Enricher has, you know, benefited from these um, these pledges. And um, the, for those who follow me, you know, I've been in a lot of commercials in the last year. Um, but that's sep it's one thing to put a black face. I shouldn't say blackface, but a black person in a commercial because, you know, we are the leading like trendsetters with products and services. But it's another thing to give us money so that we can pay for what we need in businesses, expand our business, get a new more inventory, expand to different locations, which really gives us power. So I think for everyone who is taking the unconscious bias courses and reading the materials that you put together, it's it's what where does your bias start and where does the bias stop? Would you feel comfortable um, going to a, a black owned establishment and buying products and services for them? Or do you feel like, oh, if I do it, this is a charity. How do you evaluate your participation in the economic footprint of society? And so for all of these reasons, it's really important to really assess where you are and assess, hey, are you a part of the problem or part of the solution? And if you're part of the solution, what are you going to do that has economic change so that more of us have the opportunity to have our own power in this ecosystem? Exactly. And I think, you know, diversity without inclusion is tokenism, right? <laughs> so if you are putting people of color in your ads, in your branding, on your website, but you don't actually include those individuals in decisions, um, in the opportunities, in distribution of capital, right? In business opportunities, then we're, you're, you're still part of that problem. And I think um, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday and we were talking about, you know, he said, look, I've run lots of companies um, and I don't think that I've ever purposely um, excluded somebody because of their race. And I said, no, I'm pretty sure you haven't purposely excluded somebody because of their race. But this is the problem. This is why it's called unconscious bias, because we have an affinity towards people who look like us, who think like us, who act like us, who dress like us, who are going to do the things that we do. And when you don't do those things, right, we don't have that affinity, which means that we are going to be less likely to include them. We're going to be less likely to talk to them. We're going to be less likely to give them opportunities. And that's all it takes, especially in this fast paced world where technology amplifies everything. You know, you take uh, AI and try to help it you know, help a company with their, um, their, their bias issues, if they don't do that right, it's just going to amplify bias. It'll just get really good at being biased. <laughs> so we have to look at how do we interrupt it? Where are we showing up um, and having those tough conversations and asking ourselves, am I contributing to this? And if we ask that question, and if we're really honest with ourselves, the answer is going to be, uh, yeah, I am contributing <laughs> to the problem. And it's funny, you kind of made me think of certain situations that I've had to deal with. Um, as people know, um, when I was younger, I raised over 600000 in high school to pay for my college um, education. And I did that by writing 200 letters to different organizations across the country, telling them how it's going to change the world and technology and all of this, right? And so I thought growing up that I was mostly judged by my intellectual capability, my work ethic, all these awards that I was receiving. And then um, someone told me, always do an exit interview when someone says no for whatever grant or opportunity that you apply for. And so I started doing this and some of the people were like, Rashana, I just don't like your hair. I was like, really? I don't like the lipstick you're wearing. I don't like that you wear dresses. You don't, you don't wear t-shirts like most tech people in California. And I'm from California originally. I was like, I've always liked to wear dresses and that's my decision to show up in the world as I am. How does it have anything to do with my proposal for the grant? Oh no, it's the best one we received, but we didn't, <laughs> we didn't, you know, we didn't want to, you just don't have the image that we are, we want to align ourselves with. And I think it's a lot of, it's important for, for us to get people to tell people what their bias is and you can hear it out loud so that we don't constantly think that we're not good enough. We didn't put our best foot forward. And that's happened to me many times where people said you were the best, but we cannot um, support you because of something that was irrelevant. Right. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's, 
that's tough to hear, but I guess it's necessary to hear, right? <laughs> and it, for people who say that bias doesn't exist, there's a prime example of it, right? So I do want to, because you are um, just a trendsetter, right? So here we are. What I find really interesting is that you're in this space where you've managed to uh, conquer uh, the, the financial world, right? You're like, okay, we're going to deal with that. And now you're going into online dating. Tell us about this. What, how, wh how, what? Well, as you mentioned, uh, Black women are the number one uh, sector of new business starts. And oftentimes, because we're not funded, we work around the clock and really don't put a high priority on dating. So the stats are also that black women also are the most single group of people. So I'm like, aha, here's a market for both money and for both love for this demographic that it's very successful, wants that VIP luxury experience and, and just wants you know quality, safe environment um, to uh, find uh, their ideal mate in. So we are... Launching in Love, which is a matchmaking platform um, that provides VIP luxury experiences. There's no swipe left, swipe right. There's none of that. That's part of it. So we curate experiences for successful business owners who are ready to find that relationship. And it's just for that reason um, that I mentioned. Gotcha. And so is it all only in Atlanta at this time? We are launching here in Atlanta because Atlanta is one of the largest cities that has uh, women-led businesses. So we thought this would be the perfect city to launch in. Um, and we should be rolling out nationwide uh, soon thereafter. Awesome. Okay. No, that sounds really great. I'm sure my sister will be happy about that because she's in Atlanta. <laughs> so... <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, this is such a great conversation because I'm, I'm really hoping that there were individuals who are listening because sometimes I feel like we have these conversations and we're preaching to the choir right the people who join are the individuals who kind of already know this you know they're kind of on the train already you know they're they're fine to help they're on the journey and a lot of the people who really need to hear this conversation don't hear it I feel like a lot of the people, like I said, the underwriters, I feel like we need to take a copy of this and send it to the like our, our Underwriters Association. We need to send it to all the various places where they need to hear this and need to really be thinking about how they're showing up in the workplace and how their bias is creating barriers um, to people. And, um, you know, I just wanna say thank you to, I can see a few comments here. Um, Demetrius mentioned the Crown Act. Uh, I saw that Christina said this is a great session. Steve says it's sad that people use their power to keep others down, which yes, it really is. Um, and uh, Teresa says, yes, this is a great and essential conversation. It, it is. Um, I just, I wonder, I think what I would ask is everyone who's listening, right? You'll, you, you'll see it in the LinkedIn feed, or if you're listening on Facebook there too, right? Share it, share it with somebody who, could potentially benefit from this conversation because we really need people to hear this. We need to hear what Dr. Novellas has to say. We need people to really be thinking about their impact on, um, on the world, not just the workplace, not just businesses, but on humans uh, and how we really need to be looking at connecting better in, the, uh, in this world. So I'm excited about this. And actually, oh, you have a comment, go ahead. Before I yeah, and the reason that I show up every day and have people reject me time and time again is because I know I have the work ethic, skills, the ability to be a solution in this space. So I'm not here solely for education and inspiration, even though I can provide those things. And Richard provides a solution through capital, through resources, through our communities, through even this in love platform, because we're tired of people being performative and pretending like they're care and, and actually not doing anything to help anybody. I am doing everything I can to help people. My company in Richer is doing everything that we can to help people. So if you know anyone that needs some working capital, that needs any of the resources and uh, solutions that we provide, please have them reach out to us at Enrich Her. We love to help them. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think that is such a great way for us to end because, you know, we, we're like kindred spirits <laughs> because, I mean, we do the same thing, right? At, at Rework Work and we are in this place where our goal is to impact individuals and not just to impact them, but to show them how they impact others because we can't touch everybody. But we understand that if everyone starts to self-regulate and looks at how they are impacting others, uh, we can definitely change change the world. And part of that is uh, we've actually created a new community. So if you want to join us, we are trying to you know find resources and information because what you said, uh, Roshana, is performative. We do work with leaders who sometimes I'm going, oh my goodness, they, we, we've got to get them from performative to performance, <laughs> right? To how do we actually make an impact? And um, I'm really excited about just getting the word out and creating awareness and uh, working with leaders that want to make a change. So again, I would just ask those of you that are listening today, share it. Let's get some people listening and get them focused and um, follow Dr. Roshana Novellis on LinkedIn. You can follow me on LinkedIn. And uh, we thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna put up a, let's see.